adjunct associate professor of uh, linguistics at the University of, uh, of Santa Cruz, and she's also a researcher at uh, NASA Ames at UARC. Uh, she's going to talk about, um, she's going to tell us how we should speak to our computer. <laughs> and I, I often speak to my computer, and people think I'm crazy, so I'm kind of glad to see there are some people who really study this, uh, this <laughs> effect. And uh, most, most seriously, she's going to describe two major projects uh, one of them is a uh, Clarissa project, which is uh, uh, the first spoken dialogue s system in space. And uh, also the Regulus project, which is a toolkit for unification grammar based on <laughs> uh, language modeling. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, now a little, little reality. Can we turn the sound up from the computer? microgravity, things float away. So you have to keep using your hands in order to control the objects. To help the crew with this problem of working in microgravity, Clarissa is a voice-enabled procedure browser that helps them work through the procedures while keeping their hands and eyes free. Starting procedure, WMJ nominal insight water processing. Step one, unstow the backup syringe. By having a, a voice dialogue, with the computer, when our hands are full, we can actually listen and be guided uh, uh, through the procedures uh, with Clarissa. Do not touch any connections. The Clarissa system can distinguish between commands that are meant for it and side conversations with other crew members or with mission control. Hat. Houston, is there a way to adjust this valve by running through the screws? Just press on. We appreciate all your work. Roger that, Houston. Go to step five. Step five. Remove the red cap. No, on step four. Step four. The crew can direct the system by giving simple voice commands like go to step three, repeat, go back, show figure one. Show the picture of backup syringe and micro sample in flight analysis bag. Uh, you can make simple corrections by saying things like no, I meant step four. There's some intelligent systems behind it where you say no stop go to this step yes. and it does quickly in developing clarissa we've worked with a lot of crew members and the astronaut corps has been very enthusiastic about the system they feel it'll help them do their work more efficiently point three warning value is off nominal high report value to mission control before proceeding to next step when we're flying aboard space station crew time is really important there's a lot of things to do and the more efficient we can be, the more uh, effective our missions. This technology will have benefits for exploration to the moon, Mars, and beyond. It'll help crew members be more effective in situations where they need to have their hands and eyes free. <laughs> the future is, is boundless. We're, we're explorers. We're going to go to the moon, Mars, and beyond. In order to help us, because we won't be able to bring as many people <coughs> as we can, it would be great to have a, a super interface uh, with, the, with the computers. Having new human-machine interfaces, such as uh, the voice recognition and the, and the dialogue, speech dialogue with Clarissa and, and beyond, can uh, really be useful for us. No, don't play again. Okay. So,
this became <laughs> okay. I guess I had an automatic transition on that one. We'll go fast. Um, <laughs> okay, we won't. Um, anyway, the Clarissa system became the first dialogue system used in space in June 2005. It was used by astronaut John Phillips. Um, it worked great, and on debrief, um, John Phillips thought that it would be a really great thing to have on, you know, like with wireless mic. He could go behind panels and carry the procedures with him. Um, so that was all very successful. Um, so as you saw in the video, I'll just give a little bit more background. <coughs> Astronauts are constantly executing procedures. Like there's about, last time I looked, 12,000 procedures for the International Space Station. Everything has a procedure. Um, and in the current scenario, they read it from paper or they have a PDF viewer. And in either case, you're having to take your hands and eyes away from the task to either scroll the computer or to flip the pages. Um, and since stuff floats away, taking your hands away from the task means Velcroing everything down and then doing, you know, flipping the page or scrolling and then unvelcroing everything again to go back to what you were doing. So this is not so efficient, and that was the impetus for building this system. Wow. <laughs> okay, that's not what that was supposed to look like. Um, <laughs> interesting. Anyway, okay, let's see what I can do about that. Why did it change the fonts on me? Okay. Sorry. Let me see if I can fix this really quick because it'd be good <coughs> to be able to see this diagram. <sighs> okay. It didn't look like this when I left home. All right, let's skip that. Um, that was a diagram of a dialogue system, <laughs> um, but we'll move on. Okay, so the key objectives in the Clarissa system were to have a procedure-independent browser, because of course you've got 12,000 procedures, and you'd like to be able to just plug procedures in. So you had to, even though we didn't do 12,000 procedures, we had to think about the design so that you would be able to put new procedures in. Um, we needed a habitable command language. And by habitable, I mean easy to use, not hard to remember, pretty much does what you need it to do without you working at it too hard. Um, it had to have hands-free operation, obviously. And we wanted to have robust dialogue. We were constantly asked the question, well, what if it makes a mistake? You know, and automatic speech recognition is not perfect. Um, human speech recognition is not perfect. <laughs> so mistakes are going to happen. And um, the best thing to do about them is to have an easy way to fix it. So here is the procedure independent part. Um, it's designed like a CD player and CDs. The software is the CD player, and the procedures are the CDs. These particular CDs are XML data files. Um, so, and it has to capture the information in the paper versions of the paper or PDF versions of the procedures, because those are official NASA documents. And if you're putting this out there as an alternative to the official one, it better be <coughs> accepted as equivalent. Um, so you have to have the exact language for the display. But you know, speaking and reading are not the same. So we actually had to have additional information in the XML so that the spoken version would come out right. Um, and we had to be able to convince ISS operations that it was equivalent. And they are paid to be paranoid, so they're not that easy <coughs> to convince. Um, so the flexible command language, um, there's always a trade-off between accuracy and flexibility when you're doing these kind of applications. Um, and the astronauts are real trainable. They're used to being trained on everything, and they're very clever, and they're easy to train. 
Um, and they typically come from a military or an aviation background, which is kind of good, because they're used to things having a controlled language. But, um, and, you know, of course, they prefer the system to perform really well. So in the accuracy versus flexibility trade-off, we could go a little in the direction of accuracy. But, you know, not completely, right? Because even if you got people who are used to controlled language, they're not going to be 100% on that. And if they're tired, which could happen since they're overbooked when they're on the ISS, and, you know, maybe they're not feeling 100% because being in space isn't totally good for you, um, you don't want to make it too hard. You want to make it be so that the first thing they think of probably works. Um, and for the accuracy versus flexibility trade-off, there are two basic ways that people make the language models that tell you what language you're going to understand. One way is based on grammars, you know, like from if you had any grammar training in school, you have rules that tell you like a sentence can be made of these pieces. And we have things exactly like that. Um, or you can do statistics. And you can look at the probability of words co-occurring near each other or in a particular order or that sort of stuff. Um, the statistical ones tend to be good if you have new people coming to the system and you can't really, you can't easily predict what it is they're going to say. If you have people who are going to use a system over and over, the grammar base will give you more accurate performance because those people who have used the system will learn what it is that the system can understand and they'll produce the things that you're ready to understand. And in those circumstances, the grammar-based ones will do better. So we adopted a mainly grammar-based approach, although we have some statistical stuff mixed <coughs> in. Um, so let's talk about the hands-free operation in a little more detail. Oh, this is, wait a minute, I haven't talked about it yet. Okay, this is the hands-free operation part. So there were three things, four things, I don't know. The, the habitable language, the procedures being um, that you can plug them in, new ones, and hands-free operation. So big point of this is for them to have their hands free. If their hands aren't free, we've, we've really not done the job. So there's a way that a lot of systems work that's called push to talk. So you push a button, then you talk. Um, this is out for this application. Um, so we needed to do open mic recognition. The big problem with open mic recognition is you have to be able to tell whether they're talking to you. They might be talking to mission control. They might be talking to another astronaut. And when they do those things, you shouldn't react. But you have to be able to tell the difference. So that was actually the research challenge for that piece of the project. OK, and robust dialogue. So this is like getting out of it when something goes wrong, which is inevitable. So you have noisy background on the space station. In fact, if the space station was on Earth, OSHA would shut it down as an unsafe workplace because of the noise. So um, <laughs> pretty bad noise. Um, and open mic recognition, even under the best of circumstances, is also not going to be perfect. Um, and speech recognition is not going to be perfect, <coughs> human or machine. And, you know, things will happen. So we have to be able to undo or correct commands. If you hear that the system hears the wrong thing and it starts to do something wrong, you need to be able to stop it and have it do the right thing. So we built stuff so that you could say undo and it would undo whatever had happened. Or you could say, no, I said, and whatever it was you actually wanted. OK, now let's go and look at how some of this works. So first we're going to look at the whole problem with, um, I seem to be having some psycho font thing going on. Um, let's hope not too much more of that happens. Um, OK, so text is not speech. If you think about it, if you're going to read something to somebody, you probably aren't going to read it to them verbatim if you're in a situation where you're doing a task. Um, and we had to worry about this when we were 
making the XML formats for representing these procedures. There's also lower bandwidth. You know, if you're looking at something, you can look at the whole page. If you're listening to something, you're hearing it linearly just this much at a time. So you have to take that into consideration. You need to be more explicit because if they're just getting the spoken version, so say they're behind a panel and they can't see the display, you need to be able to get everything that you need to know from that. You can't be looking around over here or look around over here and say, oh yeah, that's what I need to know. Okay, so let me show you a little example. So here's an actual procedure that we worked on. And what happens in this procedure is they're checking out spacesuits. This is a spacesuit maintenance procedure. And this chart um, is designed for more than one suit. OK? So what happens is that you have to ask which suits you're working on because you're only going to fill in part of this table if you're only working on one suit or two suits, right? Um, OK, so the other thing is we have to, these little things on the side, like these little things over here, these all are little code for all kinds of stuff. So here we read the step title, but then this means that mission control and IV should be doing this thing. Right, so here we have little notations for who should be doing stuff, and we need to tell them that too. Um, and we can't just say MCC, you know, HIV, this wouldn't, spoken, that doesn't really work. Okay, down here, we are going to check the status. So check status, suit P, blah, blah, blah. Well, we're going to say check status. We're not, you know, like, you have to know how to say that. Okay? <laughs> And these have gotten themselves suddenly out of the right place. But so this actually goes here. This goes there. And it's saying for, actually it goes there. For EMU2, what is suit P? This one underneath that you can't see, that says for EMU1, what is suit P? OK, and this is another interesting question. If you have a table like this, how do you read a table? You don't want to read like all these headings, read it in a row. That makes no sense. It kind of depends on what you're doing with the table. If you were reading values off of this table, then you'd be asking like, what value do you want to know? Um, if you're filling it in, then you're going to be asking, what value do I put in here? Okay, so it all kind of depends on what you're doing with the paper procedure. So the same paper procedure, the same structure in the paper could have more than one way that you need to produce it when you produce it as a verbal one. Okay, here's another one. Here, there's a, a conditional. There's a condition that has to be met for doing some of the steps. So we're going to ask, for EMU1, is the dry L LV LCVG to be filled? You know, Because if it is, then we've got to do some steps. And if it isn't, then we're not going to do those steps. Okay. And then here, we have to know that we were working on EMU1, and we have to know that we were going to fill this dry LCVG, and then we do this, OK? Down here, you know, it's the same kind of thing. Whether or not you've decided to do these procedures for a particular suit, then you have to produce a different set of things that you're going to say. So that was kind of the problem with that. Also, in these procedures, they have some like sort of full programming language kind of structures. So they have branch points. They have queries that we have to get back to the user. They have numerical input. They have conditional steps. And they link to sub-procedures. So our XML had to handle all of that. Um, and then there was getting sign-off. <laughs> They're formal documents. They're official. They go through many levels of approval. And um, they represent really a lot of work of people originally coming up with the procedure, testing the procedure, having astronauts try out the procedure, revising the procedure, updating the procedure, having 20 people sign off on the procedure. Um, so, you know, they're 
a little skeptical when you are trying to extend this to the voice version. And we had to like work pretty closely with the guys at JSC to make sure that they were happy with our interpretation. <laughs> um, OK, so that's about all I'm going to say about that. Now we're going to move on to the grammar-based recognition. So remember that this is how I said we did the language model. In a dialogue system, your that diagram that wasn't quite working out, your first component is the speech recognition. Then a whole lot of other stuff happens. But trying to get a good output from the speech recognition is going to help you in the later processing. So you're going to try to get as good a one as you can. And your language model goes into your speech recognizer as a constraint on what language you're actually going to recognize. And it's very important to do that, because the speech recognition problem is very hard. And if you try to recognize anything, your accuracy is going to be terrible. Okay? When you have dictation systems where their job actually is to recognize anything, you also have to train on a particular voice, because you need some kind of constraint in order to be able to do that problem. Um, here we were using speaker independent models because you would have more than one astronaut using it, for one thing. Second thing is voices change in space. So by having it speaker independent, we weren't vulnerable to that. Um, next. OK, so here's what some of the system functionality was that we needed to cover. You could navigate. You could go from step to step. So step 2.1, go to step 5, go back. Um, you could change the volume. You could undo or correct commands. We talked a little bit about that already. We could set and cancel alarms. Astronauts who needed to do procedures with lots of timing were taking up either bags of egg timers or like 10 watches up their arm um, for doing that. And we said, mm, computer could do that for you. That might be a good idea. Um, so you could query status. You could ask, where, where am I? What step am I on? You know, what time is it? Stuff like that. Um, you could visit non-current steps. So you're on a step. You could just, you had another mode where you could pop up and go look around without changing what step you're on. Um, they could put voice notes on there, and you could manipulate the voice notes however you want. You put them on, you play them, you delete them, whatever. Entering numerical information, that's like what I was showing you with the table. There were about 75 functions in this system in total. And here's the kind of things you would say to the system. So it's not just like you know one word thing and there's one right thing to say in one situation. Because our model is to make it so that the first thing that you think of is probably going to work. And if not, the second thing you think of is going to work. So we really want to get what you're actually going to say to the system and put it in there. And we, we not, don't just want the first thing you're going to say to the system. We want to come up with like the 90% most probable things that anybody using the system is going to say to the system. And we're going to build them all in. OK, now the vocabulary size is a little bit deceptive because the syntactic structures that we had in the system were actually fairly complicated. So this 260 words multiplies out to a pretty big language model. Um, I mean, I've had bigger ones, but this wasn't teeny by any stretch of the imagination. OK, so we're using the grammar-based recognition because we want to get the better accuracy, and we got the trainable users, the trainable repeat users. And, and statistical methods need lots and lots and lots of data. And we had no data because you know people hadn't done a system for astronauts to do procedures on the space station before. So there wasn't any data laying around. Um, people in um, computational linguistics often do systems on travel reservations because there's been 20 years of data collection on travel reservations, and you can just go and get a database of data. But no such luck here. Um, and, you know, they changed their mind a whole lot about what they wanted this thing to do what, during the time we were developing it. So we needed to be able to change it really fast. So what we did was we developed a technique for building these grammar-based models um, based on examples in a semi-automated way. Well, pretty automated, actually. Um, so normally, what most people do to build grammar-based models is they build them by hand for every single application. This is the commercial state of the art. Um, we thought this was sort of nuts because, you know, basically 
There's a lot about English that stays the same whether you're making travel reservations or talking about procedures. So we want to capture that part of English that stays the same and write a single grammar for English that we will reuse. Okay? And this unification-based grammar, that's a pretty high-level grammar formali uh, formalism that linguists are very familiar with. And so people with a linguistics background would look at this and think, oh, yeah, this is really normal. Um, in fact, like my students at Santa Cruz, my linguistics students at Santa Cruz look at these grammars and they say, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay? Now, the version, that, the version that you have to actually have, well, I'll get to that. So what we do is then we want to get the application-specific version of the grammar by doing some kind of processing on this thing using these examples and end up with a new grammar that's like the pieces of the, the general grammar that we need for this application. Okay? And then this unification grammar, this is not the format that the speech recognition software wants. It wants what's called a context-free grammar, which is a much lower level sort of a formalism. So think like um, you know, a, a normal sort of programming language versus machine code. Okay? This is like the programming language. This is like the machine code. And we have a compiler just like you have for compiling programming languages. And we compile from this into what the recognizer needs. Um, and we've gotten very good performance from this system on real tasks like this one. Um, we've had some other tasks. I did a system for Ford Motors, and we've done a medical speech recognition, a uh, medical speech translation system, and this, this uh, approach has worked really well for all of those. Okay, so here, this diagram kind of works. It's good, except I don't know why it's giving me this font everywhere. That's not good. Anyway, okay, this is the general grammar, okay? This is a lexicon. You have to put in some domain-specific words. Um, we get the training corpus. The training corpus is just a set of sentences that you want this thing to recognize. And then these operationality criteria are some formula about how we're going to restructure the grammar when we make the application-specific one. This training corpus... For the first version of Clarissa, I made up 200 sentences. So you really can get around the data problem because you can just make stuff up and that works pretty well for a first cut. Um, after the first cut, then we feed the data that we're actually getting from people talking to that version of the system back in. And as your training corpus gets bigger, your behavior gets better. Um, so we get this application-specific um, unification grammar by doing what we call explanation-based learning specialization. It's a machine learning technique. And it takes a subset of the information that's in this general grammar, and it also restructures the grammar to make it easier to process. Then we do the compilation that I was talking about, where we compile it into the form that the speech recognizer needs. That's the, whole, that's the regular system up to there. After that, we hand it off to Nuance, which is a speech recognition platform we're using, and it compiles to um, a PCFG, so it, it uses this data in the training corpus to put probabilities on the grammar rules, which actually helps your accuracy. And then it compiles it actually into the recognizer, so this thing ends up actually built into the runtime recognizer that you use to do speech recognition. Okay, so this system, we built this regular system up to enable you to do this kind of technique for building the grammar-based models. And it's an open source platform. You can go find it right there. Um, it has an integrated development environment, and we've been using it to build bunches of stuff. There's also a project, Australian Defense Department has a project, and some people at Gothenburg University have used it, and you know, it's, um, and it's been quite successful for all the things that it's been used for. Okay, next, let's talk about the open mic. How does that work? So we need to identify what we're calling crosstalk. That's the talk that's not aimed at the system. And we need to be able to distinguish that from the stuff that's aimed at the system. Um, so when you do speech recognition, the result you get out 
is words with confidence scores. So the speech recognition does its thing. It comes up with its best guess about what the words are that were spoken, given the acoustic signal, and some guess about how sure it is that that's what the words were. If you have low confidence, we're thinking that could help you tell if you have crosstalk. You know, because if the speech recognizer is less confident, mm, might not be something that the recognizer knows about. So the thing we're really using here is that the recognizer has a limited domain, and we're kind of looking for stuff that's out of the domain. Um, and some pairs of words, and some words, will suggest that this is not aimed at the system. So we want to use that. OK, so this is kind of what recognizer output looks like. So you know, here's an 86, and here's a 76. And it doesn't actually matter what these numbers mean, except that some are bigger than others. Okay? And then for an entire sentence, you're like taking some kind of average over those confidence scores. Now if you look down here, this is stuff we shouldn't be getting. OK, here's stuff we should be getting. And you can see like the confidence scores, they're you know, pretty high. OK, we look down here and like, whoa, confidence score for that's really bad, right? The average on here is going to be really kind of a lot lower than averages here. Uh, same for that one. Here, though, we got a really high score here, and a really high score here, and a really pretty high score here. And this one's lousy, but when you average them all together, this is going to be maybe high enough to get accepted, which is, you know, bad. <laughs> So the confidence scores don't always give you a perfect result on picking out what you want to respond to and what you don't. Um, but it does suggest, you know, most of the time the confidence scores are pretty good. So it suggests a, um, a naive solution. Um, you use the average confidence score, and you play around, and you find a really good threshold, cutoff threshold. And if it, the average score is below that threshold, then you decide that it's not for you, and you ignore it. Okay? And the advantage of this technique is, it is really, really simple. And you didn't need much training data. And our classification error was about 10%, which is usable, is very usable. Um, I would give lectures like this one, where I would give live demos also. I would leave the mic on. At, while I was giving the lecture and talking about the system and giving examples of commands that the system gave. And I didn't have that many misfires. I'd maybe have one misfire per lecture. Um, but you know what? We could do better. So we worked with a guy who's at Xerox Europe. And he's an expert on um, support vector machines. And what we did was we said, OK, so let's treat this as a text classification problem. There's a lot of work on classifying documents. So you look at a whole document, and you look at like what kind of words are in the document and patterns in the document, and you decide whether the document is this type or that type. You're, you're making a decision of what bin the document goes in. And he is really quite um, experienced at doing that and had a lot of good techniques for doing that. And support vector machines are real good at that. Um, so you use a weighted bag of words model. So you have the words, you don't worry too much about the order, you put some weightings on the words, and the weights are the confidence scores. So we adapted this technique, and we treated each utterance as a little tiny document. And it wasn't completely clear that this would work from the outset, because the commands are really a lot smaller than documents usually are. Usually you have you know, at least a couple of pages of material to get information out of. And we were having like you know, 15 words, 10 words. But um, what we did was we took it, and we took the confidence scores to be the weights. And it's this known problem. And it worked pretty brilliantly, because we got the classification error down to 5%. So, and this is a very simple generic method that uses readily available software. And um, we, we were pretty pleased. And then we worked on it a little bit more um, after the project. And we actually got this down to a little under 4%, which is really good. That means it's hardly ever going to get it wrong. 
you're, you're not even going to notice, really. Like, if it gets it wrong, you're just going to say, oh, how odd, because you're going to hardly ever see it do that. So that was how we handled the open mic. Now we're down to side effect free dialogue management. So in the diagram that wasn't working out, once you get done with the speech recognition, you pass it along to a thing we call the input manager. And the input manager does some semantic interpretation. It does a couple of things. It brings your interpretation, um, your interpretation coming out of the speech recognition is kind of general. It's not really tuned to the particular domain. Um, the input manager takes care of that, and it interprets it given the domain. Then it passes a representation to the dialogue manager. The job of the dialogue manager is to decide what it should do in the conversation. It decides what the system should do in the conversation. So if you get a command, you have to decide if I sh you know, the system should talk, if the system should scroll to a different place in the procedure, you know, whether the system should ask for clarification, because it's totally the, the nerve center of deciding how to behave in the conversation. So, and we wanted to get side effect free dialogue management for a number of reasons. Um, we wanted to support these robust corrections. We wanted to be able to do those fast and reliably. Um, we, we wanted to be fast. And we wanted to be able to support testing. Um, Context is really important in dialogue management because you're basically looking at the context both of the task and of the conversation to decide what it is you should do next. And, um, and it's both the input and output for the DM. You're getting a representation of the context coming in plus whatever you think they said. And then you're going to have a new representation of the context going out given what you've decided happened. Um, and there's two kinds. There's the context of the conversation, and there's the context of the task. Okay, so if you're in a, in a world where you're arranging a bunch of blocks, and you say, put it on the red block, you know, it, you're going to get that from the previous discourse, because you're going to look at something you were talking about before to figure out what it is. If you say the red block, well, that's probably coming from your knowledge of the task, OK? Um, so that's kind of an example of those two sorts of information. So what we adopted here was what's called an information state approach. You have states, you have moves, and you have actions. The states are this representation of the context. The moves are the interpretation, basically the interpretation of what you think they said. And the actions are things that result from looking at the state and looking at the dialogue move and deciding what to do. OK? So, so you start off with a state. And it's like a vector of values. OK? I, I just I don't have any idea why this font has gone insane on me. Um, OK, but this is pretty readable. It'll be all right. That's a 17. Um, OK, so you have an ID, <laughs> in case you can't tell. Um, yeah, this font's really cute at the beginning, but it's like not so good now. Um, OK, so that's an ID number for this state. We give every state an ID number. That's 18, OK? So here we say our location is 2.1. So that means we're on step 2.1. Our volume is 60%. and the last state was 16. Here you see that we're on state 18. Our location's now 4.2. Our volume's still 60%. And our last state was 17. This is the normal, simple kind of move. We've said, go to step 4.2. OK? We get a move, which is go to 4.2. And what we do is we have this function that figures out there are two kind of actions. There are reversible ones and irreversible ones. The reversible ones are things like going to a step, what step you're on. You can change that. Irreversible actions in this system are talking. Once you've talked, it's gone. 
you can't untalk. So this calculates irreversible action. We're going to talk. We're going to say we are at 4.2. Um, this is a calculation of the reversible actions. And what we do to get those is we compare these two states. And we look at what's different. And what's different is this. So what we calculate the action to be is the thing that will get you from here to here. And there it is. Navigate 2.1 to 4.2. OK? So these actions can be reversed if you need to. You just get rid of them. Um, these can't be. And we treat those a little differently. But here you can see also, this will be good for the next slide, the volume stays the same. This you know, just increments. OK? So your values, this value came really from interpreting the move and interpreting what had to be different for that move to make sense. Um, the rest of these values came from looking at this and maintaining what you had or doing this incrementing. All right. So here's, ah, oh, come on. Hmm. OK. I think we're going to skip this. This is, I'll give you a summary, though. What happens in the corrections is that you identify that you had a correction. So no, I meant decrease volume. OK? And what you can't see because of the stupid font is that what you're looking at here is not only state 18, you're looking at state 17. OK? So when you go to do a correction, you do your calculations from both the current state and the previous state. OK? So when you look at the volume value, you're going to look to state 17 and take it from there. Um, and you're going to take the other things. Well, actually, you're going to take this, and you're going to make it be. You're going to make it be whatever it needs to be. So you're going to decrease the volume from here. But you're going to go back, and you're going to keep everything from the previous state 17. The upshot of this is that when we do the corrections this way, there isn't actually any undoing. There's the same calculation, essentially, that you make with normal steps. You, make, you just are using two states to calculate the functions instead of one. It's absolutely as fast as doing normal, normal uh, commands. The corrections are no slower. They take no more processing. Um, and so we've got our speed that we were looking for by doing it this way. Um, also, it's very declarative. So the declarativeness means that you have it all in one place, and you just are stating relationships between the states. And that's the essential core of the whole thing, just stating relationships between the states. Now, it has some advantages besides doing corrections really quickly and fast. Um, you can also do confirmations so that you can look at the differences between the states, and you can figure out what you should confirm or not confirm. You also can do regression testing with this, which we did do, because with all of the material in the vector in the state, you've basically recorded everything about the task, everything about the conversation that you need to know. You store that with a test set, and then you can run the test set. And you can run the test set even if your system changes because the environment, the necessary context, is all encapsulated. In most systems, that information is spread all over a bunch of different procedures within the system. And then if you change anything in the system, your previous test data is completely no good because it won't work anymore with your system, and you can't reconstruct what the context was. So anyway. That was really good for that, and this approach was really quite successful for doing those things. So what's next? Ah, font again. Sheesh. OK. 
So Ford Motors, there's a system for in-car use that I worked on that was voted first in the internal tech fair at Ford last year. Um, this is a rover. I'm working with Professor Chris Kitts at um, Santa Clara University. He's also the head of the Crest Center, which is over here at Moffett Field. Um, and um, they have robot clusters that we've been working with. And some of my students have done spoken interfaces to control the robot clusters. And we're looking at doing some more of that. Um, also, uh, Professor David Miller at University of Oklahoma. Um, this particular wheelchair is called Tin Man. <laughs> And I've been working, I, I worked with him on an interface to this robotic wheelchair because um, a lot of people, if you need a robotic wheelchair, like you don't, you know, other controls may be difficult for you, but maybe you can talk. So if you could talk, then you could get your wheelchair to do what you need it to do without it being too much of a strain. So that's the idea there. Um, and um, thanks. Um, I'll post these slides without the font problem on my website. <laughs> so you guys can go look there if you want to see the slides that were kind of not working. Okay, so if we have time for a few questions. Yeah. What is the hardware you use to Well, actually, yeah. Um, you can't run software like this without having something about the equivalent of laptop, but all of this runs on just a normal laptop. Now, for NASA, they had to actually have laptops that survived this radiation test. So they take the laptop and they irradiate it a whole bunch, and then they see if it still works. Um, <laughs> at the time we did this project, they were like totally sweating trying to find any like halfway modern laptop that would survive this. And they got IBM ThinkPads to do it. There was one version of IBM ThinkPads that passed the radiation test. And you know, then they were like, woohoo, we're going to get a whole bunch of these and put them on the space station. Because you know, like, it's really hard to update the core space station software. You know, it's like up there. And so a lot of times, if they want sort of more up-to-date stuff, they do it with laptops. So this ran on the normal, standard space station laptop. They were using a noise canceling mic. And actually, that took care of the noise problem. We didn't know what was going to happen with the noise problem when we sent it up. I mean, there's lots of techniques you can do to try and deal with the noise. But we didn't, we didn't actually do those because we had a lot of other things we had to do for this project. But when they used the noise canceling microphone that was on the space station, it was perfect. They had no trouble hearing. We had no problem doing recognition. So that problem was actually just taken care of by hardware. Yeah. Are they using this system right now in the International no. Space Station? No. Um, priorities refocused. Um, so I just want to ask you about the, the um, maybe I didn't understand it correctly, about the accuracy rate. I thought you were saying it was around a 4% uh, error at, at best. There were two but things. Okay. There were two things. One is the error that you get from deciding whether the system is being talked to or not. And we got that under 4%. Okay. And then there's the error for speech recognition. So do you recognize it or the not? Correct, the correct. Okay, so I, well, one thing I wasn't clear on where you, when you were saying whatever the error rate was, and it was low, but yeah. it still seemed to be that it was high enough that it didn't quite seem to fit with your concept of, well, you don't s really see any real errors even in a lecture talking about it. It seemed that... Um, um, well, I was talking about the, um, I was talking about the uh, open microphone. Right. So on the open microphone decision, just deciding whether the system should respond to this utterance or not, that was under 4%. Okay. And in practice, I could give entire lectures and I would maybe have it roof once. Okay, so maybe I'm not understanding that then. So when you say it's around 4%, that's one in 25 commands 
that well, that's under a pretty harsh evaluation. Okay. That's under a pretty harsh evaluation. Like that's where we were like doing a lot of things that would really were kind of designed to mess it up. Okay, so if we took, <laughs> if we, if we took the real case of the astronauts, okay, yeah. doing the real thing, and you, and you ran through one of those there procedure There were no sets. errors. There were no errors at all. No. Well, okay, I take that back. There was one problem, and the one problem that he had was while he was in the middle of using the system, right over his shoulder, a speaker came on with Russian mission <laughs> control speaking like right over his shoulder. And there was one misrecognition from that. He turned it off and everything else was perfect. So given that, are you, would you be comfortable about using that for a mission critical system or is that still not good enough because I of don't, well, possible errors? You know, I don't think JSC would be happy with using it for mission critical and we weren't really trying to target that. Okay. There's lots and lots and lots of things that they do that aren't like, you know, is there going to be oxygen or, you know, does the space station stay in one piece kind of stuff, right? There's tons of stuff they do that's like testing their water and, you know, doing experiments and all kinds of things that aren't critical path things. And always for software like this, the first place you put it is in the non-critical path places, right? And this is plenty good for non-critical path stuff. It's plenty good. Um, the error rate you're getting from this thing, it's not any worse than you would get from the astronaut reading the paper procedure, especially if they're tired or they're not feeling good, you know? Okay, that's okay. <laughs> It's really, you know, and, and their time is really, really scarce, you know? They're always overbooked up there, and if it makes it faster for them to do the procedure, that would be a win. Yeah. Over there. I had a question about the reversible versus. Yeah, that uh, was a little muddled because of the font problem. Sorry. So, do you only need that when you're trying to implement an undo? Yeah, the using the two using the two states to do the calculation is only when you're doing an undo or a correction. So the first thing you do is you identify, you know, you do the prior processing to identify that you have a correction or an undo. And then you know to do the processing with the two states instead of doing it just with the one. But doing it with the two states is, is no slower. Because you essentially do the same thing. Yeah. You said that you had not sure this is doing anything. Um, you said that you had some words and some pairs of words that would indicate a high probability that it was not yeah. an utterance aimed at the system. Yeah. Does that mean that you taught the system to recognize certain words that it itself would never use, such as Houston something something? It well, okay, there's two things. There's words that are just plain out of vocabulary. Woohoo! If they're out of vocabulary, you know, if they're outside the coverage of the system, then we're going to say, wow, yeah, that's an indicator that they aren't talking to us. Okay, for sure. But even words that are in the system, if they're coming together and in the coverage of the system, they're extremely unlikely to ever come together, then that's another indicator that you're probably getting language that isn't directed at you. Mm. Not inside the space station. The space station's a big tin can with fans and all kind of crud going on in there and no insulation. So a lot of fan noise? Echoey, fan noise, yeah, all kind of mechanical noise. Yeah, lots of that. Lots and lots of that. Yeah, so I mean, like, we worried a lot about, like, should we be doing techniques to try and cancel out the noise? And we got tapes of some kind of noise from there and, you know, but in the end, we didn't actually have enough information to even know like what kind of noise adaptation to go after. So we just thought, well, let's see what happens with the noise canceling mic. And we got really lucky. And that, that hardware took care of the whole thing. Okay, right. thank you very much. Thank you.